Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Good morning, welcome you all to this lecture on this in this course on analytical spectral and microscopy applications of inorganic compounds and nanomaterials. In the previous class, we have been looking at uh, these techniques of uh, X ray absorption spectroscopy, namely the exhausts and exanes. Uh, we have looked at uh, the basic principle quite well and how it differs from the, the uh, XPE spectroscopy and what kind of information that we can get, particularly you can get the information of the nearest neighbors, this uh, number, nature, number and the geometry, all of these coordination sphere. While in XPS, you can get the oxidation state and the charge and those kinds of things that you can get in case of the XPS. Uh, so, obviously together you can get much more information. So, uh, towards the end of the previous class, we were looking at one of the example of uh, the uh, reaction mixture between the mercury and cysteine. I have talked to you that the different species formed at that particular given concentration in the pH conditions and can be fitted with the different species that are formed that are possible and therefore the data can be derived for each one of these and take a combination and uh, fit with that. So, if you have taken a different ratio of the mercury to the cysteine, let us say higher, high, uh, lower ratio, then you would have got lower ones more you are taking much higher something like 7 or 8 equivalent so that then you would have got mostly 90 percent or more of this species rather than that. So, this is very well suited for every uh, system of the inorganic. Look at another example here. This is the FeCN6 uh, 3 minus ok. So, the intercalation of this intercalation of this is seen into the, the nickel aluminum hydrotalcite which has got a chloride for exchanging with this. So, this can the chloride can be exchanged with this ion the FeCN6 3 minus ion. Of course, uh, this uh, when you make this particular pieces. So, you can see the, the chloride ions completely not exchanged the total uh, partly. So, is that could be confirmed from this. So, what this is under uh, note what this is done here in this is you take the XPS spectrum or exaf spectrum not XPS, XA spectrum, X-ray absorption spectrum or exaf spectrum of this uh, the basic uh, nickel aluminum hydrotalcite uh, uh, system and then the one which is exchanged with the, uh, with the ferrocyanide thing. So, these two were taken and uh, you can see that the these two spectra the uh, are shown overlaid one of them is with the dashed lines other one is the uh, the dark uh, the full lines and then you can see there is a very much good fitting coming between these two that showing that there is a replacement of the chloride by these ferrocyanide ions but there are other informations are known from other spectroscopy like FTIR etc i hope you are looking at the the spectrum here uh, from the other spectroscopy FTIR raman etc you could see that there is some level of reduction taken place for iron 3. When it is reduction is taken obviously it will become iron 2 and then your, your, your counter cations will obviously change. So, that is becomes K 2 N i F e 2 or K N i F e 3 these are the things. So, that both are a part of uh, this particular the nickel aluminum hydrotalcite when you intercalate with the ferrocyanide. So, it will not be completely ferrocyanide, but it is uh, some part of the ferry also is there iron 3 or iron 2 and uh, they have done also certain additional studies by leaving that system for longer period the reduced species increases. So, that means uh, that your fitting pattern will change and therefore, that was also being identified ok. So, therefore, you can use the exhaust spectrum for this uh, the intercalation of this into into this uh, the host species of the hydro talcite compound in that. 
So, this is another example or another the application that we have looked. Let us look at some applications. Uh, we have looked at a few applications in the inorganic or coordination chemistry, the species formed in the solution, in the titration, and the intercalation, those kind of things. Now, let us look at some examples from the metalloproteins as well as metalloenzymes together in that. So, I draw your attention to this particular slide now, and this is the characterizing the exhaust data for a given metalloprotein uh, here, establishing the metal bound core, or in other words, the metal coordination sphere, and that is what you are. So, you have the, the oscillation spectrum, uh, this is in the uh, inverse angstrom versus the intensity, but uh, if you do the Fourier transformation, you get this one, you get the distance. Of course, there is a phase shift, you have to apply the phase shift to get exact distance between the scatter, the absorber and scatterer. So, absorber and scatterer could be in the primary, could be in the secondary or a combination of these things. So, that is where you need the fitting. So, the data is shown by the dots and the fit is shown with these things and based on that fit, you can derive the metal center uh, here with the three of the histidines and one of the glutamic ok. So, this is E, E is a glutamic. So, three histidines and one glutamic and two waters abound. The distances if you see that you can see that the three nitrogens and the water roughly within the range 2.01 to 2.04. So, they will all be uh, bunched up and then you get as an intensity with that with your other information as well. And then you these are bit far 2.4. 2.47. So, how will you find these things are from the histidine? Because you can get the next atom scattering with the secondary atom scatterings can be obtained from this. So, from that you can derive yes, there are histidines and this many number of histidines. So, you direct one may not give that, but you need to look at the, the secondary things as well. So, fitting with all that, you could get the three histidines, one aspartic and two waters for this particular thing. Probably this may be one of those atoms I have not noted here, but it is ok, it is probably manganese or something ok. So, any of the metal approach. So, that you understand that you have a oscillation spectrum which gives the inverse uh, phase, inverse angstrom convert into the angstrom, but here it is a phase shift. So, you need to apply that. So, you have something within the below the two angst 1.5 angstroms, below the two angstroms, then above the two angstroms 2 to 3 etcetera. Of course, you can rely up to 4 uh, uh, most of the cases you can do that. So, and if you do you know, several scans and measure etcetera, I think you can do a little bit more of that secondary uh, scanning. So, uh, you need more fittings. So, fittings are available nowadays a lot, not in the earlier days, because a lot of small molecular spectra are studied and then uh, fixed. So, you can use them as a model compounds. Let us look at some more example. This is another the spore photoproduct lyase is of course, the enzyme is a lyase, photoproduct lyase, uh, a member of the radical S adenosyl L methionine super family and that is the belonging to that particular family. So, you have one. So, this catalyzes the reversal of the spore photoproduct, it is in that ok. This is uh, studied by other methods like for example, Mossboyer and this uh, SPL thing uh, is a purified one. It shows 40 percent of the 2 iron 2 sulfur. In my mass buyer, I have already explained to you how to establish 4 iron 4 sulfur, 2 iron 2 sulfur, all those things we already talked about. From the peak uh, areas, you can get the ratio, and that based on that exhaust, uh, sorry, not exhaust, mass buyer, you can get 40 percent of 2 Fe 2 S, 15 percent of 4 Fe 4 S, etc. And when you reduce this, obviously, it all goes to the 4 Fe 4 S 1 plus, which is a 60 percent. And this information is being made use for fitting the exhaust data. So, I know that we are talking about the exhaust data. The exhaust data was measured for this, this SPL enzyme, which is in the black one, as purified SPL in the presence of a SAM, that is a red one. So, the as purified and as purified SPL in the presence of this uh, methionine family. So, when the enzyme uh, is bound to that uh, and then SPL in presence of the SAM reduced case similarly. So, both the oxidized case and the reduced case both are being studied 
and both as the pure one as well as when it is bound to or interacting with this adenosyl l methane super family of that so these four spectra are there and this spectra are the the oscillation spectra which is the kappa space which is nothing but your uh, the scattering factors and this is the one which is converted into the uh, the space uh, the distance so you can get this here there is no phase correction parameter so you can directly take the distances you can see here the major peak which is uh, somewhere for iron sulfur with the 2 2 2.1 angstrom range and then you have something lower 1.9 range iron oxygen iron nitrogens then iron irons come around 2.8 to 3 kind of a things and beyond so that's what the cluster is so you can try to establish this cluster by using all these four uh, spectra both the oxidized form as well as the reduced form oxidized form bound to the sam or uh, uh, and the reduced form which is bound to the things using these you can get now you can get the 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 metal is shown in the red here and uh, this fe4 and the sulfur is the thiolate sulfur is shown with this and then these are the uh, inorganic sulfurs and the distances obviously differ so these uh, uh, distances are much different 2.28 2.23 and whereas this ones 2.7 so a little bit bit longer than these uh, ones and some of them of course shorter these values will vary from the oxidized versus, versus the reduced as well you can very well establish these ones you cannot establish very accurately from the x ray crystallography because x ray crystallography is done at 2 angstrom 1.5 2.5 angstrom resolution uh, for the single crystals being a huge protein you will not get very accurate so you will get with an error bar of uh, 0.2 0.3 angstrom here you will get 0.11 0.02 kind of a error bar so you've seen that how the fitting etc can be explained let us look at another uh, example i've been telling to you earlier that secondary scattering etc see an example here this is shown for a manganese with a histidine bound as one example i should so when it is a histidine bound it is bound to the nitrogens but you can have scattering from other carbons or other nitrogens of the histidine so histidine has got the two nitrogens and three carbons as you can see kindly see this particular slide please so you can have from the c4 directly or you can have from n3 via n1 so there will be multiple scattering so you can have a single scattering you can have a single scattering you can have single scattering double scattering or multiple scattering from other atoms so these are not, not binding so these are called secondary atoms so these ones secondary shell maybe tertiary shell shell so they all could influence and then you can see the main is the manganese nitrogen so that means more number of the histidines are there that is the intensity then you can get the c2 c5 the next nearest neighbors and then these ones so you can analyze so very well so for small molecules these were very well established and this data is being used as a modal compound for the enzymes now on the right side what we have is the the dimanganese centers of the different enzymes the enzyme in a ribonucleotide reductase where it is manganese is being substituted originase hemerythrin manganese catalase and this is a small molecule manganese 2 imidazole 6 so six imidazoles are bound and imidazole is the representative for the histidine so is binding part of that now you have the spectrum so using this one as a as a control spectrum you can try to fit with this and derive the data yes that is being done and that is shown on the next slide so when you derive that data so the derived data is given here in this table and you get a model fitted to this so arginine this kind of a bridging and the bound so one carboxylate other two histidines and the carboxylate in the bidentate and monodentate and similarly here carboxylate in the monodentates and the bridgings and there is no hydroxyl bridging here water and in this catalase again by di bridging and here some atom which is not very well resolved but you can get some uh, information so you can get all the primary coordination with some level of the secondary coordination details of the enzyme in this case di manganese center by fitting this particular exhaust data with the model uh, systems a lot of them you can get that and that is what is done so typically what you do is 
you find the distance okay and the coordination number means how many such atoms are there this is the this is the standard deviation thing you don't need to really worry then for the manganese oxygen for the manganese nitrogen you can get that the number of nearest neighbors so all of these uh, so you can get the oxygens and nitrogens uh, so from that you can build how many histidines are there etc and when it's not fit with the thing extra oxygens will be coming from the oxygen distances so you can see this is the distance this is for the ribonuclear reductase arginine hemerythrin and catalase all of these are given here so using this particular data you can derive the structures that you have so we don't need to go more into those details and those are the ones which are taught in your research or when you are interested in learning more into that okay we can derive basically using all this okay so let's look at another example in this particular uh, case so the molybdenum enzyme molybdenum center in molybdenum enzyme called nitrogenase uh, you have the iron molybdenum cofactor is there present in that so this is the exhaust and part of the xane data which is not shown here but in that paper you have both using all this the structure has been derived with respect to molybdenum with respect to iron as well okay so you can get the molybdenum with oxo bonds sulfur bonds etc all of these uh, this is your oscillation spectrum with respect to fe k shell and this is for the molybdenum k shell okay so that correspondingly and this is the fourier transform spectrum for the iron and the fourier transform spectrum for the molybdenum so that means both the centers you can study and then try to get and fit with the thing so here itself you can see the the fit is the bluish and the red dots are your experimental data so experimental data is fitted with that fitted with it models and the percentages etc now this so using that fitting etc the fitting parameters from mo and fe exhausts so uh, molybdenum sulfide uh, with this kind of a uh, distance 2.336 and um, the nearest neighbor is showing as 1.5 and mofe is again showing as 1.5 and 2.7 distance these are the error things uh, mo short one 0.9 1.7 34 uh, another one 2.2 another one long 2.124 so molybdenum oxygen or molybdenum oxygen long molybdenum sulfur short and molybdenum sulfur short comes because of the the if you have the molybdenum with uh, uh, with double bond sulfur so molybdenum with the thiolate if you have it will be long so this will be long bond and this will be short bond okay similarly for molybdenum with oxo it will be short and uh, molybdenum with uh, o and some something is there alkyl group is there then this will be long so you can have short long also you can differentiate so that means whether it is coming from a double bond or whether it is coming from the alkoxide or cysteine so you can find that kind of things because the distance is coming very well in this so this will give for the nearest uh, uh, coordination neighbor etc and this will give the distance you can fit and along with that you also have iron with the sulfur the four nearest neighbor with 2.269 and uh, iron iron 2.7 so this error bar so you can you can fit with the molybdenum structure i may not have shown that correspondingly here but you can do that model is being fitted with this so exhausts and xenes i have not covered in this particular slide that one so we have looked at the examples of the inorganic coordination then we have looked at the examples from the metalloproteins metalloenzymes let us look at some applications in the catalysis nanomaterials etc because we have been looking at such examples in each and every case okay uh, one of the example is shown over here uh, generally this uh, titanium with a uh, you know, boride which is doped into the carbon titanium bc kind of a composites nano composites they are very important because they can be used as a protective coatings for machine the machine tool elements so because the reason is they have the 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 hard faces the crystalline hard faces like this uh, titanium boride titanium carbide they are very hard and then they also have some softer amorphous the carbons so that is titanium carbide uh, so you have the all those 
the, the amorphous carbon. That means not titanium carbide. It is simple carbon. So it's simple carbon in the amorphous form. So therefore, you have a titanium with a boron, a boron uh, the coordination titanium with a carbon, and then some carbon, uh, which is so that is what the amorphous carbon. So 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 overall, you have a hard, you have a soft combination. This can be used for the machines applications for the bringing the friction, low friction and wear resistance and toughness. That is where it is used. Let's take here a situation on one side, you have the exafs data. Uh, again, people have done both the exafs and the Xanes information give you only limited, then exafs give somewhat better. And this is done for the uh, kindly look at the slide, titanium boride and on one hand and titanium carbide. These two are mixed and then made uh, with these ones, with the different titanium boron, uh, boride carbon with the different ratios. So, 0 0.7 carbon, 0 0.1, 0.27 carbon, 2.48 carbon, 4.35 is increasing the carbon. You can see that as you go from here to here, you, have, you are increasing this carbide level of the peaks and the carbon, the uh, ones that you have and these portions are being reduced into these things and this is being increased and this part is being increased and that is what is. And this is happening because you are forming a ternary phase from the titanium boride and with the carbon then titanium BXCY kind of a phase. Okay? So, this is corresponding to the titanium carbon bonds given in good agreement with that. So, this the changes are, are coming because of this the gradual increase in the intensity of this peak with the carbon addition agrees well with the gradual transformation of a hexagonal kind of uh, arrangement around titanium to a cubic arrangement. So, even the geometry as I told you earlier, the uh, so with respect to titanium how the carbons are there, the carbon hexagonal type or the cubic type, they will differ and therefore their distances and uh, and intensity. That is what he is explaining in that. So, you can see the whole level of the surface, how the surface is modified by mixing this titanium carbide and titanium boride and together to bring this kind of a material. So, in the material science this will be used. Okay, so, another example here, you can synthesize metal oxide. Example is shown for the cobalt oxide phase. You can uh, synthesize this obviously, even from the solution cobalt uh, 3 oxide CO3 O4 nanoparticles from a solution phase, but this does not produce the kind of a nanoparticle that you are looking for which are useful for this, uh, this hollow metal oxide nanoparticles will not come from the solution phase. Even after you make from the solution phase heat at 200 degree for 3 hours and in presence of the air etc it will not come, but if you synthesize this the, the phase of this one, the cobalt oxide in the presence of the hot air, then you will start forming this cobalt oxide uh, oxide nanoparticles, which are non-crystalline. Therefore, these could not be understood from XRD. So, therefore, only the XRFs. XRFs, as I told in the beginning of this, you do not require crystallinity. You can have amorphous, you can have solution, you can have gels, any kind of things you can study. So, therefore, uh, whereas XRD requires the poly, uh, crystalline uh, uh, nature. So, therefore, the XRD will not uh, uh, give the any pattern for the amorphous phase. So, the amorphous phase can also be studied by this as group has done the understanding the air oxidation process. So, when you make this uh, uh, cobalt oxide and you keep heating in the hot air at 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 90 minutes, you can see that the 90 minutes is this side as you go from here as it is and then 5 minute, 10 minute, 30 minutes and so you can see that this particular cobalt oxide peak is reducing and then cobalt cobalt peak is increasing with that and that brings a lot of this uh, amorphous nature and that has a better that oxide has a better uh, catalytic property and therefore that is being used. So, cobalt oxide nanoparticles could then easily be dispersed in organic whatever is made from this hot air uh, thing can be dispersed into solvents and then do catalysis on this. So, you can see in the material science how well these are all used. You can also look at uh, this is some species in the reaction, a catalytic species. 
So this is a catalytic species uh, uh, for the. This is from the calcium nitrate and phosphoric ammonium phosphate. By controlling the calcium phosphorus ratio, 1.67 gives one kind of a phosphate, which is labeled as uh, the HAP0. And then uh, if you have 1.5, which is a little less of that, and HAP1. So these two can be treated in acetone with pal palladium dichloride di PHCN uh, or acetonitrile also you can use. That uh, uh, yields hydroxyapatite bound palladium complexes. So with, uh, with this one, first one HAP0, the second HAP1. So uh, again draw your attention to uh, this particular spectra which are uh, basically the exhaust spectra obtained for all these cases. Okay? So you have the HAP0 case, HAP1 case. So these two are with the 0 and these are after C and D or after recovering. You do a reaction and then you recover and then look at that. Okay? So that palladium edge here you are looking at. Here in this case the palladium edge. So when you put the palladium you can see from the species can be derived from the exhaust spectra when you derive and fit with the modal compounds you will get a thing of this kind this of course chloride species. Here you have a palladium which is bridged between the two phosphates in a, in a multiple way and here the chlorides are there here no chlorides are there. So these are all there in the surface and the surface species as we know are responsible for explaining the catalysis and this particular catalytic surface is used for the oxidation of benzyl alcohol to benzaldehyde and this if you do not have this palladium does the reaction very slow. But when you have this kind of palladium species the turnover increases by 236,000. So almost a quarter million times so 0.25 into 10 power 6 times the reaction is expedited and then now you can see what are those species and then now you can get the idea of that. Can be used extended for various things here for gold thio clusters nano clusters. So, gold 25, thioloid 18, gold 38, thiolate 24. And then these two cases, if you examine, you will find species like this, and species like that, and species like this. So, and uh, this one. So, these are by AUC type, not carbon, C type, S type, O type. These are all different kinds of things, AU atoms bonded only to AU and those bonded to sulfur and those bridged by sulfur. So these are referred as AU, C, AU, S, AU, O, etc. These kind of species to different extents they are present and for these two clusters crystal structure is known. So therefore we know very much uh, what, how much of these each of these are there. Now you can use their the spectra, the exhaust spectra and then you can quantify with respect to that. Then the one which is given below AU144SR60, no crystal structure is known and for this you can derive the absorption, uh, X-ray absorption spectrum and fit with the whatever the data that you understood from here, you try to fit with this and then you can give what is the kind of things that you have. Okay? So these were supported by crystal structure data these two and then based on the success of the two clusters of this, the AU144 cluster is analyzed. So the AU bonds are shorter in this cluster than the these ones. So the AU AUS bonds are the same. So AUS have got the almost the same, but AU AU bonds are different, are shorter in this example. So this whole data is being being analyzed and fitted with all that core. So you can see how many of these kind of species, etc., etc., are there. So the AU AU bonds are in the range of 2.7 to 3.3. And then the other ones in all these clusters uh, is being analyzed for 25, 38, 144. So this is a, a very good opportunity to find the stiffness within the AUAU clusters uh, with well-defined atomic structures and surface modification. Because these are used later on for various kinds of uh, applications, these kind of clusters. You need to know what kind of a properties that these possess. Okay? And that is where the applications we are talking about the AU, AU bond, AUS bond, how uh, stiff they are, how softer they are, all of these. So the data that is being brought in here can be, can be seen here with respect to the crystal data and the exhaust data. You can see how very well fit with the coordination number and distance. 
So for this also very well fit. Now this data is fitted with the 144. There is no crystal data here, but there is a DFT data is there and these are being fit. So to all those species like AUO, AUC, AUS type of the data and that gives the AUAU AU distance, AUS distance, etc. And all of these are shown. The shorter and the longer AUAU AU and the AUS distances. So this cluster data will be helpful in future for various other applications. As usual, uh, after every end of the topic, I give the practice uh, sessions. What I would say is, so I would like to draw your attention to bring to the literature. A lot of data is available, exhaust gains. You may not get the distance data. You may get the mostly the, the oscillations. So you, in, if you are using that oscillation type data, then you look at the paper. What are the details they have already analyzed and given and use that one. Otherwise, you go to the uh, cases where you have the Fourier transform data is given. And the, please practice the interpretation of the primary coordination sphere in the complex, in the inorganic complex, in the coordination chemistry complex. Similar kind of exercise you can do with this of metalloprotein, metalloenzyme. So I hope that with these two classes, or the previous and this one, the basic principle of the exhaust genes and then how it is applied, how it can be used for, uh, now it becomes very routine, but you cannot use routine because you require a, uh, the, these um, X radiation generators. Uh, so therefore, cyclotrons, uh, synchrotron centers. So only at the synchrotron and cyclotron centers, you measure these ones. They are there very limited in the entire world. That is why the overall data is limited. Otherwise, these, the technique is very well versed. Now, in the initial days, people were able to get only just the primary coordination with a lot of error, but now with very little error, they are able to get. And for enzymes, for the metallo enzymes, this is much, much better than the, the single crystal structure, not for the small molecules. Okay, so I hope. Uh, so we'll come out with uh, another uh, technique in the next class. Thank you very much.